Fantastic. Uh, so good morning. Welcome to another Campaigns Breakfast. This is a, an extra special one um, that our colleague at Sustain, Oliver Ratcliffe, is delivering for us, all about engaging our MPs um, based off the, the success of the Day of Celebration and Action and uh, some brilliant rumblings that we've had from all of you that um, MPs may be starting to take an interest and in, in, it might be a good time to, um, yeah, start to push some of our national policy agendas. So it's an exciting time and uh, we're really lucky to have the expertise of someone like Ollie uh, to help us all know how to go about that. So it's going to be a really um, great session. So just to, I'll pop the agenda in the chat now, um, but basically the order of the event is that we'll have um, a fairly nice chunky presentation from Ollie. Um, so we'll split that up with a Q&A halfway through. Uh, there's a few of us in here. So if, if you can start off putting your questions into the chat, then we'll try and manage those ourselves. But if there's not too many, then we'll ask you to unmute. Um, but if you can start off putting your questions in the chat, that would be great. Um, and then once we've had two sections of, of Ollie's presentation and a couple of Q&A sessions, we'll then have a presentation from uh, Caroline from Eastbourne Food Partnership. Um, to hear about uh, her sort of experiences of engaging with her MP and some of the successes and, and maybe some of her, her top tips as well. Uh, so really looking forward to that. So just uh, quickly before I hand over to Ollie, I'll just give everyone a couple of updates. So a reminder that the deadline for um, this round of uh, grant applications is the 21st of November. Uh, we do have a recording online um, about what those grants are, how much they are, um, and, and some advice about applying for that. So do check out that recording if you weren't able to make it. Um, the, the deadline for reporting on grants that you've already got is the 31st of October. If you've got any questions, do email us. Um, and then we've got loads of events coming up, which is really exciting. So um, on the 1st of November at 11 a.m., we've got a session on uh, Good Food Movements grants, uh, an email should have gone out to coordinators, but we'll make sure that goes out on the Rise Up list as well. We've got a webinar on the cost of living uh, and local action by food partnerships on the 7th of November at 10 a.m. Then on the 10th of November at 10 a.m., we've got um, a webinar from the Food for the Planet campaign. So that's Every Mouthful Counts, Unlocking a Local Good Food Revolution. It's gonna be great. We'll hear from some food partnerships and some councils and um, a summary of the uh, Food for the Planet report that's about to be launched. And then um, coming up in December on the 12th at 2 p.m., we've got um, a fringe farming webinar. So that's policy practice and action for local food growing, working with local authorities. And that's going to be um, a panel session, should be really interesting. So that's a lot of events to take in, but I've, I've sent multiple emails. Sorry about that. So hopefully you've all got that in your diaries. Um, uh, yes, anyway, that's enough from me. So now I'm really pleased to hand over to our colleague. Ollie. Awesome. Thanks, Bella. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ollie from the Public Affairs team at Sustain. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And hopefully, you can also see. Uh, can I get a thumbs up if you can see that? So that would be great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm Ollie from the Public Affairs team at Sustain. Um, I'm going to be cantering you through the um, wonderful world of Parliament today. Um, let's be honest, it's completely chaotic at the moment. Um, but I'm going to be giving you some tips about engaging with your MP. I know some of you are already on the ball and already doing some great work. So apologies if you're you're ahead of the game with a lot of what I say. But I just thought I'd go through um, some of the, the sort of key messages. Um, so what I will cover, um, I'll sort of talk about very quickly, I think the first half I'd like to maybe spend a little bit less on than the second half. Um, but the first half I'd like to talk about how Parliament works, the nuts and bolts of Parliament itself. And then I'm going to touch on some of the devolved nations, um, sort of constitutional and what's devolved um, in the devolved nations. Um, and then the second half, um, I'm going to be giving you some tips on how to actually engage properly with your MP and, and hopefully get somewhere with them. So that's the summary. Here we are. So um, forgive the diagram, but this is, uh, I think, a pretty good reflection of the uh, pyramid of power, if you like, even though it's not a pyramid, 
um, of how Parliament works. So um, you can see number 10 and the PM at the top. Um, they then choose the cabinet secretaries for each of the departments. Um, you've got then the junior ministers within those departments. Um, a PPS, some of you might not know what a PPS is, but they're a member of Parliament who is a parliamentary private secretary for a particular department. Um, and they are um, allocated by the PM or the cabinet secretary. Um, a SPAD is a special advisor, so they're a, a civil servants who are um, brought into the departments to advise. They're you know, supposedly experts in a particular field, so they sit alongside the ministers um, in a department. And then you've got the civil servants um, below them who are obviously, uh, they sort of obviously are not, are not part of political and they um, are sort, of, sort of belong in each department. So the, the, all of the areas in grey are part of the government and they're part of the government payroll. You might hear it called sometimes in the news. Um, and um, well, at the moment, if you blink, you might get a new cabinet secretary. But um, usually they're supposed to, they're used to supposed to say um, stay in post for a decent while. Um, but obviously at the moment we've had a tremendous amount of shifting. Um, and this week we are now having a new cabinet team. Um, but I thought I'd just highlight this because obviously some of your MPs in your area might actually be on the government payroll. They might be a minister, they might be a PPS, as I mentioned before, they might be a cabinet secretary. So just be mindful of that. Um, PPSs are quite hard to come by and so that it can be quite opaque who is a PPS. Um, uh, I only find that out sometimes in the email signatures uh, that I get, so they're not always publicly available. So do do be mindful of that. But um, I'll touch on some of the the sort of um, differences between being on the government payroll and being a backbencher in a second. Um, but the people below this dotted line are people who are not part of the government. Um, so you've got a sort of hi mini hierarchy there. So you've got backbench MPs at the bottom. So that's um, Everyone who sits on the back benches, you've got the peer, peers as well, obviously in the House of Lords. You've got APPGs, so they're um, all party parliamentary groups that uh, focus on different issues. I'll touch on that in a second. And then you've got the select committees. You've got a House of Commons select committees and you've got the House of Lords select committees who specify on um, certain areas as well. And then I've mentioned there the parliamentary party. So that's everyone who everyone who's an MP within the Conservative Party, everyone who's an MP who's in the Labour Party, and they have quite a lot of say, obviously, what goes on in terms of what they decide to vote on. Obviously, we've seen the power of the Conservative Parliamentary Party in the recent weeks because they've chosen a new leader. So they have a lot of say and a lot of um, influence on what goes on. Um, and just to sort of note here, even if um, uh, your current MP, for example, is a minister, doesn't mean they're going to be a minister necessarily forever. Um, it's a very important point because, uh, as, as I said, especially at the moment, they could last just a matter of weeks. Um, but there's a lot of movement really between these um, different areas. And the arrows here represent sort of some of the movement that can happen between them, but also the influence they might have as well. So SPADs uh, definitely have a big influence on the cabinet secretaries there. Um, Yep, so it's moving on. So yeah, so you, even though your MP might be a minister or a PPS or a cabinet secretary at the moment, they could well move to the back benches in a matter of months. It, there's there's sort of reshuffles of plenty at the moment. Likewise, it's in your interest to cozy up with a backbencher as well, because they could also be on the government payroll one day. So they could be, become a minister and they've already got you on side. So there is a lot of movement between these um sort of different areas of the pyramid. Um, and a key thing to remember as well is that, you know, these backbench MPs in particular are much more accessible. They're much more accessible than uh, government ministers. That's just the way it is, unfortunately, but they are a very good bridge to the government. So um, if you get on the right side of your MP or they're a member of a certain select committee, they can um, influence um, the government minister, they can write to them, they can put your issues on the desks of the government. So there's a sort of a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of movement between them and a sort of influence between the different pyramids. And I just thought I'd reflect that early on because I think some people, there's lots of sort of acronyms and 
uh, different ways of looking at it, but hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, moving on to, so backbench MPs, obviously there are 650 across Parliament, each representing a constituency, you probably all know that. Um, and as I said, if they're not on the government payroll, they're probably more likely to be outspoken, um, probably more likely to be uh, a constituency MP, you'd call them. So they've uh, got sort of local issues at the centre of what they do. So that's a good thing, obviously, for you guys. Um, but uh, not to say that just because they are in a government position doesn't mean that they won't care about you or eventually sort of be on the back benches. Um, they are obliged to get back to you um, and make sure you're always reminding them that you're local to put in your address because um, they should prioritise constituents every single MP. So why engage uh, with MPs at all? Um, I thought this was a sort of a very good question to ask. Um, so obviously, as I said earlier, they'll help write to a minister on your behalf, whether that's publicly or privately about an issue. So they have access points to the government. They'll help you engage with other MPs and build an alliance around an issue. They'll submit parliamentary questions on your behalf, and I'll touch on that in a, in a few minutes. They'll be able to attend events, roundtables, debates, um, and raise the profile of your issues in public domains. Um, they will be able to um, amend bills on your behalf. Um, uh, so obviously, if there's a passage of a bill, they can sort of sit on a, uh, on a, if they sit on the bill committee, for example, they can definitely make amendments to a bill, but don't think you guys will be doing too much of that. We don't do too much of that actually at Sustain either. Um, or they could start a private member's bill on your behalf, which is basically a bill that's introduced by any member of the house. Um, and so I'll touch a little bit more of, on some examples of private members bills um, a bit later on in my presentation. But um, very useful contacts to have. And hopefully, um, the fact that you're here today, you, you understand the why it's important. Um, if your MP is a minister, I just, just thought I'd quickly touch on this. They're still advised to represent you. I know some of you might be uh, frustrated that they may might not have a constituency focus. Um, but also find out about their role. You know, is their role relevant? Um, what is their remit? Um, and try and sort of appeal to that. Um, and also look up other MPs in your area as well. If you're in a city, there'll be sort of multiple MPs often in the same city or in the same region. So definitely try and engage um, with other MPs who are local, but do not give up just because they're on the government payroll or something like that. Um, okay. So I'll quickly touch on APPGs. So as I said, all party parliamentary groups, um, they're cross party. So a lot of your MPs will be sitting on these. Um, they don't have an official status in Parliament, and some of them are pretty dormant, actually, um, and they don't actually meet that regularly, but some are pretty proactive. Um, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit later on this presentation on how you can find out where your MP, um, whether they sit on one of these uh, groups or anything, but it's just useful to know what they actually are. Um, and yeah, so as I said, they're not, they're not as influential as select committees, which I'm going to touch on in a second. They're very useful bridges to other MPs, ministers. They can share things on your behalf. They can attend events. Um, so our very own Sophia actually is uh, actually um, submitting or doing some oral evidence for an APPG. Um, uh, I think it's the Green New Deal um, APPG, which is run by um, Caroline Lucas. Um, so they sort of run various meetings throughout the year and they sometimes ask people to give evidence to Sophia's talking about the sustainable food places network at that meeting um and obviously if you ever got asked to, to give uh you know a reflection on your local food partnership that that would be um pretty amazing as well great exposure um and obviously uh they obviously write reports around them and they will send these on to um various MPs and ministers so Definitely good groups to get on site, but as I said, varying levels of um, activity between them. But they all become a bit clearer later when I talk to you, talk to you how to actually find out um, whether your MP sits on them. So select committees, um, these are, again, just if you're working your way up the pyramid, um, definitely more influential than APPGs and they essentially scrutinize the work of the government. So they're usually about eight to 10 members, cross-party uh, group of MPs. Um, 
your MP might well sit on a committee or on a certain um, area. So there's um, committees for every single government department. So there's education, there's environment, food and rural affairs, there's environmental audit. You know, there's lots of different committees out there. So if you find that your MP sits on one of those committees, that's a bit of a, uh, a win, especially if it's um, a very relevant committee, such as education or food or something like that. So that means they have a bit more profile in that area. Um, I mentioned their committee chairs, without doubt, one of the most influential MPs that sits outside of government. So if you do find that your uh, MP is a committee chair, then that's great. So they're definitely going to be listened to. Um, so these committees uh, produce reports in a similar way to APPGs. They meet regularly. They ask for oral evidence from various stakeholders. Um, Sustain has been asked to present uh, oral evidence at lots of select committees over the years. Um, and they produce reports. and the, the reports have to generate uh, a response from governments. So they rather uh, differently to um, APPGs, where sometimes they're not as sort of pushy with the reports. With select committees, they absolutely um, have to respond to them, and they often get a fair bit of press coverage as well. Um, so definitely worth noting if your MP sits on any of these committees. Um, so as I've, I've just mentioned there very quickly, why engage? Um, it can boost, boost the profile. Um, yeah, I think I've touched on that. And they undertake inquiries um, and produce reports. So that's a sort of whistle stop sort of select committees, but very useful to know. Um, and you can have a look at the Parliament websites on whether your MP does sit on um, a committee. I'm going to touch on how to actually uh, dive deep into your actual MP itself. Um, themselves a bit later but um, if you were curious on what select committees are out there they're all available on parliament websites so this is the education select committee here um, so Caroline Ansell for example from Eastbourne sits on there Robert Helfman is a chair very influential MP okie doke and then another sort of um, key sort of targets for sustain and something to definitely note if, if your MP is one of these people is if they're a shadow team member or a party spokesperson for a particular issue. Um, so yeah, you can find out who's waving the food and farming flag. So for example, uh, Daniel Zeichner there in the bottom right is the MP for Cambridge, uh, but he also happens to be the shadow food and farming minister for Labour. So uh, he obviously will have a constituency hat on when he's dealing with Cambridge issues, but he's also extremely relevant for food and farming issues. And he um, has a lot of say in Labour's food and farming policy. Um, Tim Farron obviously is the spokesperson for food and farming there in the top left. Um, then you've got Pete Wishart, who's the SP spokesperson for food and farming in Westminster. Then you've got Bridget Phillipson in the bottom left, who's the Shadow Secretary of State for Education. So these roles, again, are very important to note. Um, and uh, as I said before, they every single MP is obliged to care about local issues, but they also might have. A particular remit in another area and you know it's, it's worth familiarizing yourself with with what they might be um covering um and why is it worth uh sort of uh, familiarizing yourself with this um obviously they can help write to governments they're often involved with the manifesto process um and as i said about the previous mps um they can submit pqs attend debates make amendments for you so very useful people to um consider so parliamentary questions some of you um already sort of submit these to your mps which is great but i would say parliamentary questions are a really good way of um keeping your mp warm if you like because um most mps are pretty much just looking for something to say most of the time um and i would say they are almost every time very willing to table a written parliamentary question for you. So let's say um, you were thinking of what, what can I actually offer my MP and what can I get out of them? Well, the parliamentary question might be an easy one. So you can ask written parliamentary questions at any time that Parliament is sitting. And then uh, they can also be asked orally at debates on particular issues, which um, uh, for particular department orals, which happen every six weeks. Um, so definitely, if, if there's something that you want to tease out of government, if there's something that you want to get more um, clarification on, um, like for example, at Sustain, we, we've we asked a lot of parliamentary questions about healthy starts, voucher take up recently, because it's a 
absolutely no information online. So we really wanted to find out what the take up was on healthy start vouchers. So we've submitted quite a lot of parliamentary questions on that. So it's a good example of something that um, is pretty opaque, let's say, in the, in the public sphere um, that you want to use a parliamentary question for. And as I said, it's, it's a good way of keeping MPs warm. They are very happy to table things for you. Um, OK, so that's pretty much another sort of um, focus on the actual workings of Parliament. So I'm going to touch a little bit on Scottish Parliament. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are from Scotland here, and I'm going to touch on Wales and Northern Ireland as well. But obviously, uh, very important to note that um, there are lots of areas that devolve to the Scottish Parliament. And you'll, you'll see Scottish Parliament in particular, there's quite a number of things that are devolved. And you can see a list there. Um, and it includes education, health, rural affairs. Um, so the Scottish Parliament, obviously, uh, is otherwise known as Holyrood. Um, they elect 129 members of Scottish Parliament every five years. They obviously have separate elections. Um, obviously, SNP are the majority party there. Um, but it works in a roughly similar way to Westminster. There, there are cabinet secretaries, there are ministers, um, there are com committees that scrutinise the work of government, much like I've just mentioned before with Westminster. So um, again, you know, we're finding out who your local MSP is. Um, do they have a role in government? Do they have a role on committees? What is their remit? You know, really sort of familiarizing yourself with um, where they sit in the sort of uh, parliament sort of system. Um, and I think I've got the next slide here, which sort of gives you an idea of what actually is devolved and what is, uh, you call it, reserved matters for the UK. So. Um, as you can see, a lot of the issues that you guys will be focusing on is actually devolved. So um, very worth uh, sort of bearing that in mind. But obviously, there are some things that are reserved to Westminster. But there will there are Westminster Scottish MPs and then there are Scottish MSPs as well. So just people often get sort of confused between the two. Um, so that, moving on to Wales. Um, so again, it's worth noting that uh, Labour have the majority here. So there's uh, Labour First Minister, Mark Brayford, um, 60 seats in Wales, um, they're elected every five years, and again, very similar sort of um, makeup to Westminster, there's cabinet secretaries, ministers, committees, APPGs that scrutinise the work of governments, worth familiarising yourself on who your local member of Senate is. Um, and again, lots of areas devolved, particularly food and farming, health, um, and education. So um, definitely worth noting uh, who your local uh, representatives are. And there's a nice little diagram on what's devolved there. Um, so you can see this, again, a number of things which Senate is responsible for. And lastly, uh, Stormonts or Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, so they elect 90 members known as MLAs every five years. Um, I've got a link to the full list there because there's, there's a number of things and it, it looks too big on the slide, but um, I've just put some examples there for, again, education, agriculture, health and social care, all devolved. So very important to note um, and uh, sort of uh, looking up who your local legislative, legislative assembly member is. Um, although at the moment, Northern Ireland Assembly is in deadlock um, and I think it's couple of days away that they need to uh, form a government so everything's a bit uh, up in the air at the moment because of the DUP and Sinn Féin um, issues at the moment so uh, hold on to your hats if you're from Northern Ireland that hopefully things will improve soon um, but that's it on devolved and I just wanted to sort of quickly give a, a whistle stop tour on some of the things that devolved um, nations have done that have been ahead of the game, really ahead of um, England. So obviously piloting free school meals for secondary school pupils, Scottish government being very good at that. Um, the same in Wales, uh, rolling out free school meals. A good example of a devolved issue. The Good Food Nation Bill, of course, um, uh, is a bit of a triumph in Scotland. Obviously it's not perfect in lots of ways, but obviously ahead of the game over there uh, compared to England's. Um, Best Start Grant is their version in Scotland's version of Healthy Start. Um, and you've got the Northern Ireland Food Framework, which they're looking at at the moment. And you've got a food bill 
Wales, um, which uh, I mentioned private members bills earlier. So that was basically a conservative member of Senate who put forward the idea of a food bill for Wales um, and he won the ballot, which um, private, all private members bills go into a ballot. And it's literally like it's literally picking names out of a hat, actually, for private members bills. But he managed to get the first place. And that was last, I think, autumn, so a year ago. Um, and he's still sort of, they're still consulting on a food bill for Wales as we speak. So some examples there of some devolved issues and some um, progress that's happening in devolved nations. Um, I'm going to stop the questions as this halfway point, um, myself and Larry the cat. Um, so do feel free to fire any away at me because I'm now going to move on to the sort of engagement tips. Um, and more specifically looking at your MP, but I just wanted to go through the sort of nuts and bolts of Parliament and uh, sorry if it felt a bit rushed, I, I could do a whole day on on um, what, what, how Parliament works, but do let me know if you have any questions. I can't see. Thanks, Holly. I can, um, I've, I've got um, a view on the chat. Um, you'd be happy for me to fire a couple of questions at you from there. Yes, please. Yeah, thanks. Brilliant. Um, so we've got a question from um, Emily. Uh, so would it be wise for food partnerships to put feelers out to opposition candidates at this point if it looks likely there will be a switchover at the next election in their area, um, which is currently the case in many places? Or is it too early to put energy in in case things change? That is a fantastic question, Emily, and I'll go to cover that actually in the second half um, and some of the tactics that you might want to employ. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll cover. I've literally got um, a point on that a bit later, but a really good question. Great, thanks, Holly. Um, uh, we've got a question from Tali. Do you have any suggestions on um, formulating or, or putting forward parliamentary questions? Yes. So parliamentary questions, um, there, there is a, there is a, they're very formulaic. Um, in some ways, they're a lot, they're, they're quite robotic. Um, so it's always got to be, you know, to ask the Secretary of State for Education. Um, what recent representations have they had on X, Y, and Z? And there are sort of five or six different templates that tend to be regurgitated. Um, they can't be leading. So you can't sort of um, have an opinion in a, in a parliamentary question or have a uh, sort of sort of a pushing the question towards a certain opinion. So they have to be very neutral. Um, so, for example, our one some healthy start is like what's... Uh, recent representations that they had on the healthy start voucher take-ups it's not political it's not um leading in any way it's literally just be more transparent please and to give us the number of healthy start voucher take-ups so yeah um i'm happy to help um formulate some pqs if you had some in mind um and obviously the mp's office will often come back to you if it's not quite in the right format if if it's sort of a little bit too leading, they'll say, oh, do you mind slightly tweaking that because it's a little bit too leading? Um, and they're always very happy to do that. Great. Thanks, Holly. I've got a quick follow up on that, actually. Um, so with parliamentary questions, does that require quite a good relationship with your MP already? Or if there's a hot topic, have you got quite a good chance? And um, and this might be more for, for Sophia. Um, would, would you recommend that um, food partnerships are best off kind of coordinating on these or or with something like this is it worthwhile all partnerships kind of doing these as and when and sort of quantity is quite a valuable thing for getting something over the line yeah so your first point is um i would say you don't need to have a particularly great relationship with an mp to submit a pq i've sometimes just gone in to a completely new cold contact if you like and, and got a pq out of them just because i know that they're interested in that area um and have been very willing to table it um the second point about coordination um i mean to be honest i sometimes wonder whether yeah i should be uh you know minimizing the amount of pqs i'm sending out and picking certain mps but most of the time i sort of send multiple mps the same pq hope with the hope that um you know, it boosts the chances of it getting tabled. And um, the MPs will know what's already been tabled. And it's not it's not the end of the world if you sense uh, if if there are two food partnerships sending the, the same uh, PQs off to M MPs, for example. 
Um, it's always good to be transparent though with each other if you, if you are coming to these sort of meetings and you're feeding back that you're um, sending PQs off to MPs and you can maybe coordinate um, in that way. But um, you're not going to get arrested if you send the same PQ out to the same, uh, to different MPs, sorry. If that makes it, does that answer the question? Cool. Great, thanks. Thanks, Holly. Um, and Sophia's added in the chat um, that we're obviously always happy to help formulate PQs on issues that you're interested in. So just get in touch with um, me, Ollie or Sophia. I'll I'll ask Sophia to pop those emails in the chat if that's okay. But it's just our first name, so Bella, Oliver, or Sophia, followed by at sustainweb.org. Um, so do do you get in touch? Um, there's another question from Eloise. Um, it says this might be a bit off topic, but uh, do you have any advice on how to most effectively work with local council cabinet members and local MPs together? Um, so insight on how they might typically um, collaborate. So in, in their case, they're from the same political party. Yeah, yeah, no, I've definitely had situations where local councillors have been in the meeting with the local MP. Um, it, I suppose it's it's a case by case basis. Sometimes an MP is very close to a local council, like I know um, Kerry McCarthy in Bristol East, for example, um, has very good links with the Bristol Council. Um, but I suppose it's worth just um, if you have an in with the council or an in with the MP, sort of ask the question of whether you know they are coordinating with the council. And sometimes you'll be surprised. Sometimes they don't talk to each other very much, um, which is a bit of a shame because of maybe they're different parties or they just have uh, political differences. Um, but always, if you do have a sort of foot in the door with your council, do sort of um, ask the question of you know how can we get through to the MP, and they could be a route to the MP or vice versa. So um, yeah, in terms of um, engaging with the actual council members, I mean, the, the tips I'm about to sort of go through will apply to them as well. Um, and hopefully they, they tend to be a little bit more accessible. Um, most of their emails are public. Um, you can always phone switchboards to your local council to find um, uh, your, your sort of local council who leads on a certain issue. But, Council websites tend to be pretty okay to navigate in terms of who sits on what committee, who sits on uh, what area, who your local councillor is. But um, yeah, hopefully the sort of same tips really apply, which I'm about to sort of go into. Eloise is actually from, from the Bristol Partnership, if I'm not mistaken. So are you saying that there is quite a strong relationship between the councillors and the MP there? So I know I know Kerry McCarthy, there definitely is. Um, because I've had um meetings with our fringe farming uh, group over there with, with uh, the council. So um yes, um I can speak for Kerry McCarthy, who's Bristol East. Um the, the others maybe I don't know, but I know Kerry McCarthy is quite close. So if you did want to get in a room with um Kerry and the councillor, then you can definitely. Lovely, you're meeting you're meeting Kerry soon. Look at that. Yeah, she's great. She's great, Kerry. Um, but yeah, if if you wanted to to sort of make sure that they're, they're talking to each other and you're um reaching out to the council as well, Kerry is a good link there. Brilliant. Um, okay, it's 10:36. I think we've got through the questions in the chat. We are going to have another slot of questions once Ollie's done um part two. So yeah. I'll I'll round up now and hand back over to you, Ollie. Thank you, Bella. Cool. So part two, how to engage. So I'm going to go a bit more specifically about how to actually find out about your MP, um, what they're up to, and some tips on how to actually get them on side. So first of all, I'm going to talk quickly, because I think I've done uh, a few things before with you guys. I don't think I need to go into too much detail, but if you're not already familiar with these uh, websites, do check them out, especially they work for you is particularly a favorite of mine. Um, or you can use Parallel Parliament, uh, which is pretty much the same uh, and equally good. Um, but do check out Parliament websites, your MP's website themselves and their social media. So I'm sure all of you have already done this, but um, finding your MP through your postcodes from the Parliament website. Um, and it's got some pretty good information on there already about their, their career, their voting record. Um, what early day motions they've signed. Early day motions are basically um, ways of um putting an issue on the parliamentary sort of in the parliamentary domain um and you can sign 
um, an early day motion with um, with colleagues to sort of get the ball rolling really on an issue. They don't really go that far, but they're very good for um, smoking out interested in MPs in particular areas. So you can see what early day motions uh, they've signed, and you can also see their smoking contributions there. They work for you um, is much much better, I think, uh, for finding out um, about your MPs. You can find out what debates they've contributed to, what their voting record is, but it's a bit more um, sort of uh, atomized with the voting record, I think, with They Work For You, so it's particularly good. And you can search um, all of their previous um, debates and things and speeches. Um, so here's my MP, Helen Hayes, and you can see it's kind of similar to the Parliament website, but it's a bit more um, and you can also set um, email updates on They Work For You um, on particular MPs as well. So you can uh, track their activity. Um, and it is Simon Job, uh, Devon MP. Um, this is Parallel Parliament. So again, very similar to They Work For You, but um, you can see all of their committee memberships, as I've talked about previously, the APPG memberships that they're on. And you can also see their previous uh, memberships as well, whether they're signed petitions, there's the EDMs again, the early day motions, and their previous written parliamentary questions, etc. So really good websites to familiar, familiarize yourself with um, and get to know your MP. And again, you can do email alerts for parallel parliament as well. And of course, their websites, sign up to their email list on their websites. Why not? Um, get the uh, weekly email, it usually is, or monthly low down on what they're up to so i'd highly recommend that and of course twitter um most mps use twitter pretty effectively um i'm sure a lot of you are following them already so I probably don't need to uh, go into too much detail on that um so as i said uh these are some of the areas that you can look into um leader of the house update so it just this is a bit of a nerdy one that public affairs people do, but um, on Twitter, the leader of the house will do updates on what's going on in Parliament for the next uh, week. Um, so we'll see like Penny Mordaunt as leader of the House of Commons at the moment. So uh, and there's actually a separate Twitter account for that, so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, but obviously, just constantly familiarise yourself with local news, uh, what's going on in the national news. Uh, Google your MP um, if they're in the papers of for whatever reason. Um, and obviously just keep asking fellow stakeholders whether they're engaging with their MP um, and uh, get the load down. Oh, sorry, frozen. There we are. So this is just, um, they work for you. Um, if you wanted to just find out generally about, let's say, cost of living and food, um, it's really good for um, finding out what MPs have been speaking about your specific areas um, and if you wanted to search just your MP speeches and put in cost of living and food you can do that as well and they work for you it's a great tool I can't recommend it enough um okay so these are just the sort of tips really on engaging your MP and actually getting them on side so uh stalk them within reason of course um but use all the resources I've mentioned but join a mailing list their mailing list stakeholder groups if they're at an event, sidle up to them, introduce yourself, say who you are. Um, if you're really struggling to get through, you know, call their office. Um, you know, they get hundreds and thousands of emails, uh, you know, from their constituents and from other people. Um, but as I said before, make sure you're letting them know that you're a constituent um, at the top of the email. So your address often is what they look for. Um, but if you're really struggling with email, call, call their office. Um, if it's not their parliamentary office, try their constituency office and you'll hopefully eventually get through to a human being. I tend to you know, usually get through and then you can, um, it's a good way of building a relationship with their office as well. If you phone rather than email, um, cause you can actually have a conversation with someone, ask their name and they'll remember you. And then they'll, next time they see the MP, they'll like, oh yeah, Ollie called by the way, that, that annoying guy from Sustain keeps bugging us. Um, he wants you to answer X, Y, and Z on, on whatever. So I couldn't recommend sort of calling enough. It really is effective. And I, I appreciate sometimes it can feel very time consuming. Um, but if you do have like, you know, a spare half an hour at the end of the day or something, that's when the, the MP's offices are sort of, um, sort of, uh, finishing for the day, but they will often be answering the phone. So definitely recommend that. 
Um, work out who they listen to. So in, in start, obviously, a lot of you are doing this already, but um, getting the opinions of local constituents, think tanks, partner organizations, and gathering all that intel and data in preparation. Um, and if you have any links with local press, that's what always going to get an MP's attention. Um, so if you have any local journalist links, um, that's sure to get um, years pricks of your MP. Um, just to touch on Emily's point now, so um, a tactic which I think is quite a useful one is uh, to have a look at their rivals, have a look at their um, their sort of uh, recent election, for example, and work out who came second, what party came second, um, and find out if you can what candidates are thinking about running um, in the next election, because this is incredibly uh, important for MPs because this is all about keeping their seat. Um, so in some areas it's a toss up but you know they're really worried about uh for example conservatives in rural areas are very worried about lib dem candidates at the moment because lib dems fancy themselves as the rural party and they're, they're really sort of putting a lot of resource into that so find the local lib dem candidate make friends of them get in touch um invite them to an event for example um and make sure you're telling the incumbent mp that you're doing that um i think a good example of this is uh steph from lewis i'm not sure steph is here but um, she's uh, sort of um, mentioned that she was coordinating with the, the Lib Dem candidate in Lewis and uh, miraculously the incumbent Conservative MP all of a sudden got back to her very quickly. So um, absolutely to Emily's point to familiarise herself with who those candidates might be. In other areas, it's not really a toss up maybe between Lib Dems and Conservatives, maybe it's the sort of Labour Conservative area or in Scotland it might be SP and Labour. So um familiarize yourself with who who are the sort of um what is the battleground here um and uh who who is their sort of rival. So definitely is a is a good tactic I would say. Um reach out in peacetime. Um obviously um when Parliament is sitting is tends to be when they are more receptive to to meet you, but um, there there can be meetings in recess as well. It's a bit, a bit more difficult to get hold of them, but sometimes their um, parliamentary officers are still going to work and things and answering emails. So if it is August or Christmas or something like that, give it a go. Um, and if you can get a, a meeting early on in a parliamentary term with the MP, it might be worth doing as well. Um, and don't be afraid to be a nuisance. I think I've said this a lot of times, but um, yeah, by calling, uh doing chase emails all the time you know putting your email at the top of their inbox um and they will eventually answer you just have to be extremely pushy you know i mean they they can be very 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 high maintenance mps some better than others but sometimes it really does take a hell of a lot of pushing um to get them to to answer you but don't be afraid um okay i'm just going to talk a little bit about sort of the profile of 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 each MP. So you might be thinking, oh, well, I've got uh, I've got a, a frustrating MP, doesn't really care about my issues and things like that. Um, and then you might be looking at other food partnerships that have very willing MPs who are sort of very interested in whatever. But it's so nuanced of what camp an MP is in. Um, and there are ways of maybe uh, sort of uh, tailoring your um, communication to suit the uh, the camp that they might like the, they might be in so I've, I've sort of done a quick overview there are way more camps than what I'm going to talk about but um for example a lot of conservatives oh let's go back a lot of conservatives are uh absolute ardent free marketeers for example they're very small state pro-business and enterprise and growth they're hostile to tax and fiscal measures and you might be thinking you know if my MP sits in this camp um, what chance have I got so you've got people like Liz Trust obviously it being an obvious example Kemi Badenoch but I've mentioned this guy here, um, Anthony uh, Higginbotham from uh, Burnley, and we had a meeting with him about our local food infrastructure work. And he, being a storage free marketeer, liked the fact that we were um, uh, rivaling the dominance of supermarkets. So we were saying that supermarkets currently have 90% of the market share. We need to, uh, we need to uh supports local food businesses and smaller companies and the way he said it was oh this is a great free market solution to the dominance of of supermarkets and we were thinking oh wow okay that's a that's one way of saying it, actually and that was the appeal for him it was about marketizing the retail and you know it, i thought it was a good example of 
at first we were thinking i wonder why he's meeting us but then we kind of realized um he saw it as a market solution so that there are ways in even with people that you might think are impossible to break down um environmentalists so these are MPs that support net zero nature restoration more friendly to regulation generally um if you're not familiar with the conservative environment network for example um it's quite a sort of um active network with lots of MPs in there some MPs sort of unfortunately just say that they're part of the network and don't actually do too much on it but some generally do care about the environment and there are different champions for different areas so there's a champion for um sustainable agriculture there's a um a champion for nature-based solutions so again something else to familiarize yourself with and have a look at their website maybe your mp is on there um the labor equivalent is sierra again uh, a bit smaller than the conservative environment network and so they don't tend to be as proactive to be honest but they definitely um are worth sort of uh checking out um this is chris skidmore he is um currently leading a net zero review and he's a uh, probably one of the most green Tories out there. Um, this is Anthony Mangnall, also part of the Conservative Environment Network. Um, he has a Devon seat. Um, and he, we actually found him through this network because we obviously cover a lot of green issues and he's very interested in local food infrastructure. He's very interested in procurement reform. Um, so that was our way in to Anthony Mangnall because we saw he was in Sen and we thought, okay, let's, uh, let's get through to him. Um, Kerry McCarthy's uh, a very green Labour MP, as I've mentioned before. So the environmentalists, um, moving on to the blue-collar conservatism, I just wanted to mention this as well. So there are um, some conservative MPs who consider themselves like blue-collar cons conservatives. They stand up for working people. They're very interested in job creation, very interested in better wages, boosting skills and education. So if you can tailor your work around those things and your MP is in this camp, um, you're more likely to get through some. Robert Halpin's a very good example of this. Um, he's the chair of the Education Committee and um, is the MP for Harlow. But uh, there are a lot there. Again, check out the website. There's a website for Blue Collar Conservatives and maybe your uh, MP is on there. Um, and then in which case, tailor your communication around better jobs, job creation and all that kind of stuff. And then there's some Labour, some of the Labour, if your MP is a Labour MP, um, Obviously, you've got different factions within Labour. You've got the Momentum MPs, which obviously the sort of Corbyn, uh, quite sort of um, hard left MPs. And you've got Progressive Britain, which is used to be Progress. Now it's the more sort of centrist Labour. Um, and see if your MP is affiliated to any of them. And Open Labour somewhere in between. I think that was on Ed Miliband, Milibandites, whatever you want to call them. Um, so do check out if your MP is affiliated to one of those groups, in which case, tailor your communications accordingly um very quickly last couple of slides is um you know preparing for a meeting so if you do manage to get through and you've got a meeting in in place that's obviously great i know some of you already had meetings which is great um but do that research before find out what committees you sit on um, and look at their interests um gather evidence and specific info on your area um this is really important so if there's any polling evidence that you can pick out or surveys even if they're small surveys they're really good local petitions um, some sort of number crunching is always help, uh, um, helpful locally. Um, if you are able to put together a briefing, that is obviously great. We can help you with briefings, but MPs definitely prefer briefings to lengthy reports. They're very busy people. So if you're sending them pages upon pages of uh, documents, uh, very unlikely they won't read it, unfortunately. So uh, I tend to have a two page rule. If you're going to send them anything and if there is a way of condensing down what you're saying into nice succinct bullet points all the better and obviously we can help you with that but um just be mindful that they don't tend to read big reports um be helpful to their spats this is their special advisor research assistants make friends with them you know as i said before call their office is a good way of uh getting familiar with their um team um but be helpful to them you know if you've got something that you've that you've uh, just done a report or you, you've got an event that you're doing, just just constantly just send them emails and uh, whether it's um, a hot take on an issue um, that is affecting your area that you think they'll be interested in, just just send it over to them and they'll very, be very appreciative of it. Um, find authentic voices. So if you've got farmers, local businesses, teachers, parents or anything like that, that you can throw into the mix, uh, they do love to hear 
um, from those perspectives. And um, they do love an, anec an anecdote as well if they're talking in Parliament um, about their area. Just be mindful of that. So actually in the meeting itself, make sure you're clear on who you represent, if there's a network of you in the area, um, you know, the, the diversity of the different backgrounds um, of uh, what you're covering, make sure you're making that very clear. Um, have really clear asks as you are meeting them. Um, I mean, this isn't completely black and white, this go rule, we call it. So this is uh, an anecdote which uh, my boss Orla says about once an NGO uh, was in a meeting with Michael Gove and he sort of very frustratingly at the end of the meeting sort of threw his folder to the side and said, right, I can only subsidize, mandate, tax, ban. Which one is it? Um, because I don't know what you're asking of me. You're just sort of waffling on. And obviously um, that was an extreme example, but just be mindful that, you know, there's only so much an MP can do. What they can do is write to a minister on your behalf. They can table parliamentary questions. You know, they can uh, help you uh, both boost the profile of your events or, or something that you're doing. They can even do a tweet on your, on your behalf or something like that, but they can help you build an alliance in parliament. And that's a really key thing. Um, and obviously we you need to be clear, you know, is it, um, you know, is it X, Y, and Z that you're trying to ask them to do? Is it to do with uh, fiscal measures? Is it to do with more money for, for your projects? Um, be very clear because um, they can forget frustrated if you just sort of don't have any clear asks. Um, as I said before, ask them to submit PQs, events. Um, yeah, and I've covered that as well. So that's writing to their leadership team and colleagues. Okay, that's it. Um, myself and Larry, again, happy to take some questions. I've seen, I can just see the chat actually. I'm happy to go through, but if you can help me out better and any of my miss. Um... Nothing in the chat just yet. Do you do, um, do post them if you've got any? Um, otherwise, I can sneak in because I've got one on if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Cool. So just seeing, yeah, there's a lot of love for They Work For You, which is great. They Work For You fan club. Um, website links in the chat. Yes, um, I can put them in. Uh, that's done. Don't worry. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Mother. There we are. Um, sharing the slides. Yep. Yeah. Recording. So then I've asked Dolly whether um, whether we might risk alienating our, our MPs if we cozy up with the rival too much and whether you have any tips on on kind of avoiding that or whether that doesn't need to be worried about. I think I think to be completely honest, most of your energy has to go towards your MP because they are your elected representatives. So if you're cozying up to your rival and pretty much you've given up on the MP, obviously that's that's going to alienate them. So absolutely put a lot of resource and energy into your MP. If they are just completely ignoring you um, and you know, not, you're not getting anywhere, um, one thing that you could mention is that you've, meant that you've invited uh, a local council or local candidate to an event, and you might mention that in an email to an MP. And I think that is not really sort of um, going to annoy them in any way, but it will probably just make them think, ah, they're on the ball. They know who my rival is um and obviously they've got them in their sights so they'll probably be thinking right okay um i'm gonna i'm gonna get back to them because you know it's it's a great big battle at the end of the day um and they um they have to be very precious about their seats and, they, and so they're often very worried about these these rivals coming in so don't yeah tread carefully of course tread carefully don't um give up on your mp and just put all your resources on, on the candidate that might be facing them there. Um, That's really helpful. Thanks, Holly. Um, there's lots of love in the chat for your presentation. Um, oh, thank you. Well. <laughs> and we've just got another question in. So um, how can we hold our MPs to account? Um, they often make the right noises and say the right things, but then don't do anything. Yeah. I mean, wow, good question. Um, yeah, I think I think... As I said, some MPs are gen some MPs generally care about the issues. So they might be, um, you know, I, I would I mentioned Kerry McCarthy. She's a very good example of someone who generally cares about green issues in particular. Um, and you will find that they, a lot of them, do generally care about their constituents as well. So um, yeah, and you can you can tell when you meet them, it sort of resonates. But 
obviously some unfortunately you know do uh, for example, they might sign up to a, a green network, but they don't actually care about green issues, but they know it's politically advantageous for them to to be seen as green, for example. But um, it is incredibly nuanced. And I would just say, um, you know, it, does, it shouldn't stop you in your tracks when you're trying to engage them. Um, because as I said, every single MP uh, is there because their constituents voted them in. And as you're a local constituent and you're a local partnership, um, they have to prioritize you um, and they have to represent you. Um, so almost have that in your armory that you're a local constituent and you they wouldn't literally be there if it weren't if it wasn't for you and people in your area. Um, but yeah, they are you know, the ways we can hold them to account is to be as pushy as we can and to uh, try and get them to meet with us because um, that's what they're there to do. Um, but as I said, there are differing levels of of uh seriousness and interest in, in the issues unfortunately but um you will find sometimes you'll find that sweet spot even if it's a, a a surprising thing like the free market example i said you know about his his stance in the free market and that was a little bit surprising but like, okay well we've, we've managed to find that sweet spot and if they have made the right noises ollie is it worth having having that on record and politely reminding them of that is that is that helpful to spur them on um yeah there are way there are diplomatic ways of saying that yeah i mean uh yeah I'm, I'm sure none of you will 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 put those exclamation marks i you know all that kind of stuff you know i think i think there are diplomatic ways of reminding them that you know they are supposed to represent uh your area this is why i said about uh letting them know and who you represent as well because it's not often just you as an individual you might be representing a network of um you know public health officials of local farmers of local food businesses all in their area all um have a vote for them in the next election so making it really clear that you represent quite a a substantial coalition of people in their area um is is a very good well, tactic to play um Brilliant. Thank you, Ollie. I can't see any more questions in the chat right now. So what I might suggest is that we fast track our way to our next presentation and ask you to stick around, Ollie, if that's all right, in case um, there are any more questions brewing that we can um, we can ask you after sure. this slot as well. Is that all right? Um, fantastic. So um, if that's all right with you, um, Caroline, uh, it's a pleasure to, to introduce Caroline Tradewell from Eastbourne. He's going to let us um, know a little bit about her experiences with her, her MP. And um, if it's all right, Sophia, I'll, I'll ask you to share the slides. Thank you very much, Bella. Thanks, Ollie. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Caroline, and I work as the um, Veg Cities Campaign Coordinator for the Eastbourne Food Partnership. Uh, we were set up originally in 2019 and last year we became a community interest company with four directors and a cross-sector steering group. Um, we now have our lovely new coordinator Nancy who's also here on the call. Um, I've just got uh, four slides to share with you some of the activity we at the partnership have shared with our MP who's um, Caroline Ansell who's Conservative and one or two valuable outcomes from that developing relationship. So um, in this first slide, it just goes through a little bit of the activity that we've shared with Caroline. Um, firstly, starting very simply with emails. We've written to Caroline a few times on specific topics that we wanted her help on. Um, these always impact local residents, but often cover national issues. Uh, for example, in October 2020, Caroline defied the whip to support the Labour motion to extend free school meal vouchers in the school holidays for those on universal credit. And she actually resigned from her government position as parliamentary private secretary at DEFRA to do that. So we wrote to Caroline to sincerely thank her for taking this stance and to introduce the Staines MP briefing and open letter regarding the unspent sugar tax to push for this to be allocated to supporting a healthy food fund for schools. And she responded very positively to this request. So that tied up really nicely. In the end got some positive feedback from that. Um, 
Caroline was very engaged with the uh, Sustainable Food Places Day of Celebration and Action in July this year and attending and meeting director Andy and posting about the event on social media. Caroline and Andy had a good discussion, particularly around food waste, land use and the importance of building local nutritional resilience in the face of the climate emergency. Uh, this was particularly meaningful as this day of action coincided with the hottest day ever recorded. So this was at the front of everyone's mind. And it was an excellent opportunity to raise the importance of food partnership work and how MPs can be a crucial part of that. We also invited Caroline to our recent full network meeting. Um, she was unfortunately unable to attend, but she has asked for a meeting to update her with the outcomes from that. So we're really looking forward to progressing those issues raised with her support. And then we had um, some breakthrough support from Caroline. Uh, back in August, we were all experiencing that nasty drought um, and Sustain were doing a lot of work to confirm exemptions from the hosepipe ban for food growing in affected regions. Um, we had reports from Sustain's work and our own network that the guidance from our water company, Southeast Water, was unclear but was being interpreted as, as no exemption. So growers were having to make hard choices about which crops to preserve in some cases, despite an exemption being in place for things like public facing floral gardens. So along with Sustain and several other local partnerships, we wrote to Southeast Water for clarification, um, but we received uh, different responses from different customer services agents and no absolute clarification from a senior member of the company despite our requests. Um, so following a final message back from customer services, which appeared to confirm no exemption for food growing in our region, we then wrote to Caroline Ansel um, and we enclosed the email chain with Southeast Water and asked if she'd like to help. And it was great to hear back that Caroline did indeed take this forward and raised the issue in two separate debates in the House of Commons and Westminster Hall on the 8th of September as well as personally talking with Southeast Water and confirming back to us that they had confirmed an exemption for community gardens. Um, hopefully the next slide will just show a short clip of one of her interventions. Projects as well, which have a huge part to play in, in meeting the challenge. Caroline Nelson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Local food partnerships could play a really important role in providing resilience and, of course, healthy, cost-free produce to the local no. community. In this time of drought and water restrictions, however, South East Water has not made an explicit exemption for this partnership, and so this will really curtail uh, their activity going forward. Would he join with me in calling on them to revisit their position in line, I believe, with other water companies? Well. So... We had a sort of really effective um, breakthrough support from Caroline on that. Um, and I mean, we, I, I must say we're still in the early, early stages ourselves with um, developing this relationship, but there are some aspects on the next slide, which, um, as well, which we thought a huge part. may help the, um, the work progress. So um, familiarity and building relationship. Um, one aspect of the partnership which we very much enjoy here and I think has helped with engagement at all levels is that two of our directors particularly are real stalwarts of community work and so they're very well known in the community and also familiar to Caroline Ansel. Um, so we are able to build from that familiar ground to an extent and we're hoping to develop this much more as we go forward. Um, and also Caroline and her team have heard about the partnership from people other than ourselves. Um, so it, it breeds that familiarity again um, in connection, for example, with, from Sustain and um, SFP with the Westminster Day of Action. Uh, it helps raise familiarity and legitimacy for local food partnership work. Um, we try to be quite sp very specific actually about the issue that we want Caroline to help with um, as well as providing supporting material, um, particularly from well-known national bodies such as Sustain. We also tend not to overload with issues and requests. Um, so this can mean for us being a little selective and not necessarily pursuing all the issues which you'd like to cover in an ideal world. Um, but that's just our, our angle on it. Uh, 
connecting on mutual interests. Um, so Caroline showed her conviction around supporting children when she very unusually defied the whip and supported the uh, Labour amendment on uh, extending school meal vouchers. She's also very active in opposing further housing development on peri-urban agricultural land surrounding Eastbourne, which like many areas is somewhat out of control here. And it's also uh, somewhat out of the control of local policy. So there are very strong common interests which we can link into from our activities with the wider network and take forward the discussion with her, um, hopefully pursuing this action at a level which isn't possible through other means. Um, and the final slide, next steps. Um, so we're very much looking forward to connecting again with Caroline and seeing what action we can take together on several critical issues as discussed. Although confirming a date for this with her hasn't been easy over the last few weeks with everything going on. Um, we hope our experience may be being interesting. Um, we'd also be interested to hear from anyone with insights on how to handle MP engagement when things are uh, politically so unstable and MPs are preoccupied with the accumulating crises. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Caroline. It's really heartening to see, um, uh, yeah, such a great example of, of success being had. And I know it's it's um, it's not always so straightforward in other in other areas. So it's it's great. Um, Great to have such a strong food partnership in an area where we have an MP that, that is engaged. So yeah, really um, encouraging to see her. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, thanks as well for your excellent Halloween-y background. I really like that. <laughs> um, I, I wonder, um, we don't just yet have any questions in the chat. Do post any that, that you have. Um, I wonder, Ollie, if you wanted to come in on the question Caroline posed at the end there, um, sort of about the turbulent political times we're in where MPs might might be a bit distracted and, and what you propose for engagement in that kind mm. of context. Yeah, I've been wrestling with this very issue for the last six weeks in particular. Um, particularly Conservative MPs are, are quite difficult to, to tie down at the moment, um, partly because, you know, obviously all the leadership elections and whether they're going to get a call to become a minister, you know, they're all, they're all just sort of uh, a bit up in the air at the moment. So the last six weeks have been the most turbulent I've ever known it uh, for obvious reasons. But hopefully things are now going to settle. Um, uh, we we have a new prime minister and a new cabinet in place, and it doesn't look like there's going to be a general. I can I doubt there'll be a general election um, purely because the polls look so bad for the Conservatives at the moment. So they'll do everything they can to not call one. Um, so they'll probably push it right until the end of 2024. I think I think January 2025 is actually the very latest that they can do one. So in terms of political unrest, I hope we're out of the woods on that one. Um, and uh, fingers crossed with that in mind, MP should now be focusing more on constituency issues rather than the infighting of the Conservative Party. Um, Labour in particular at the moment have, have obviously been buoyed up, so um, they now see themselves as a government in waiting, so Labour MPs are now um, sort of trying to influence the manifesto process and trying to get things into the Labour manifesto in preparation of a general election and wherever it will, will be. So um, yeah, just, just bear in mind the election game is starting, um, even, though it, even if it is two years away, um, MPs have very much got that in their sights. So, um, as I've mentioned earlier about the, the candidates, uh, cozying up to the candidates is becoming more pressing now because they, um, the anxiety is definitely building, particularly within the Conservative Party, about losing their seats. Um, so uh, bear that in mind and obviously make sure you're sort of doing it carefully and not um, alienating the current MP. Um, yeah, so I'd say hopefully the political unrest is is going to be uh, a thing of the past, but uh, I don't know. You just don't know these days, do you? Thanks, Ollie. That's really helpful. Um, I'm just going to pause uh, the recording.